You're fired. Whether you're here or not doesn't make a difference. I had joined a company that supplies ingredients for school lunches through a mid-career recruitment. One day, during my first time helping with deliveries, I ended up being late. Rudy, the office manager who hadn't helped me at all, told me I was fired. I'll inform Mr. Truman, so you don't need to come in tomorrow. As he abruptly dismissed me, there was something in his expression that seemed suspicious. But little did Rudy know that his scheme would lead to such an outcome. My name is Hugo. I'm more of an indoor type, good at focusing on detailed tasks. At work, I often use computers to increase efficiency. I've had that tendency since I was a kid. While my school friends were playing soccer or baseball, I was deeply engrossed in video games or board games. Next, here. I placed my piece, showing the white side up. I checked the board vertically, horizontally, and diagonally, flipping the black pieces wherever there was white. Oh my, you're strong, Huey. The lady living next door, perhaps worried that I was always playing alone, often played with me. We played card games and board games like the game of life almost every day. On this day, she was playing Othello with me. Most of the pieces on the board were white, and the result was a landslide victory for me. I wasn't sure if she was letting me win, but as a child, I simply accepted it and rejoiced. I did it. He he. She smiled at the sight of me, a happy boy. I've never lost a game at school. Oh my, really? I was undefeated in board games, card games, and other competitive games, whether digital or analog, at school. My win rate was particularly high in puzzle games. The other day, everyone praised me. Well, that's amazing. On the other hand, when it came to sports in gym class, I had no chance of winning. Oh, it's almost 5 p.m. already. I'd better clean up the Othello board and head home. Thanks again for today. You're welcome. Come by and play anytime. Okay. Both of my parents worked, so they wouldn't be home until this time. I was supposed to go to an after-school program since leaving a grade schooler alone at home was concerning. However, since it would be inconvenient to pick me up from there, the lady next door kindly offered to look after me. My mom offered to pay for snacks, but the lady refused. Thanks to her generosity, I was looked after without any expectation of repayment. My nature didn't change even in high school. I was good at thinking things through logically and solving problems step by step. Because of that, I never struggled with math. Later, I continued to excel in math even after entering college. I see, so that's how it works. Oh no, wait, that's wrong. I stared intensely at the math workbook. As the saying goes, practice makes perfect, math was my best subject. I also liked physics, but when they ignored air resistance or assumed no friction, I found such unrealistic assumptions to be bothersome. There are quite a few exceptions, and I have a bit of a hard time with it. On the other hand, math is universal. There are exceptions, but not as many as in physics. Once you've proven something in math, it's an undeniable fact that always holds true. By combining multiple rules, problems unravel themselves. I get excited during the process and feel an incredible sense of accomplishment when I solve them. When I think about it, it's a lot like a puzzle. No wonder it suits my tastes. Oh, I see, it's this way. When the path to the solution opens up, I get this rush similar to finding the best move in chess or Avalon. But then again, there are subjects I'm absolutely terrible at. Tomorrow's test is math and world history. To me, History classes at school are just about memorizing timelines. I can't shake the image that it's just in this year, this person did this, the end. It's so dull, 
and I can't seem to change that perception now. The history explanation videos on YouTube, where they structure it like a story and explain the motives behind actions, are interesting. And if it's about some occult historical theory or something I learned through a board game's lore, I remember it well. So I have a bit of knowledge, but school classes still make me drowsy. Literature is a complete no-go. I don't understand a thing. The test material for literature gets deleted from my memory right after the test is over. My friends tease me, calling me a math nerd or something like that. In response, I'd often joke back, saying, I'm not one to dwell on the past, turning it into a laugh. Naturally, I chose a college path where I could immerse myself in math. However, my struggle with liberal arts held me back from getting into any prestigious schools. I ended up at a somewhat obscure local university, majoring in math, physics, and engineering, and managed to stay on track to graduate in four years without repeating a grade. This one's no good, this one's no good. Oh, this one's no good either. My four years at university went relatively smoothly, but I hit a wall right at the end, during the job hunt. Ah, I got an email. I heard my phone's notification sound and opened it. Got dumped again. All I kept getting were rejection notices. Fall had passed, and as winter approached, I was getting more and more anxious with no job offer in sight. Most of my friends had already secured offers. It was obvious at that point that it wasn't about my academic background. Having spent my life in small, tight-knit communities, I wasn't good at talking to people. Hugo, how's the job hunt going? Well, to be honest, not so great. Not just my friends, but even Mr. Tanner from my research lab started worrying about me. I'd written so many application forms that I lost count. I see but don't get too discouraged. Yeah, I'll keep trying. But after the latest rejection, I was out of options. I had to find new places to apply from the first round again. In this dire situation, spring was just around the corner. What, I got the job. Just as I was starting to lose hope, I received an email not with a rejection, but with a job offer. I had only sent in my application and gone through one interview, but they had already made a decision. Although I felt a bit suspicious, I didn't have the luxury to be picky. I contacted the company and arranged to start working there in June of the following year. After all the struggles to get into the company, I ended up quitting in just about two years. On the surface, it seemed fine, but internally, it was a ridiculously toxic environment. They were always short-staffed, with unpaid overtime and taking the last train home being the norm. The bosses were all terrible, and within half a year, both my mind and body were completely worn out. After two years of living like that, my health deteriorated to the point where I had to be hospitalized. Oh, so that's why there aren't any senior employees close to my age here. I thought as I quickly submitted my resignation. If a company is willing to hire someone late in the season, it's probably for reasons like this. After being discharged from the hospital, I returned to my parents' house and spent some time doing nothing. Realizing I couldn't continue like that, I started looking into finding a new job. Around that time, an acquaintance introduced me to a job. It was in a completely different field, and I wasn't sure if I could use my experience, but I decided to give it a try. Only after I accepted the job did I realize that maybe jumping into things so quickly wasn't the best idea. And so, this is Hugo, who will be working with us starting today. On my first day at the new job, I was introduced by Mr. Truman during the morning assembly. He's almost 70 years old and he's the epitome of kindness. He walks with a straight posture, leaving a strong impression as someone who was still very much active. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Hugo.
I'm completely new to this industry, so I would really appreciate it if you could kindly guide me along. This company is a wholesale distributor dealing with food products, mainly supplying ingredients for school lunches in the surrounding area. When I introduced myself, the employees welcomed me with applause. Compared to the toxic workplace at my last job, the people here seemed almost too pure, to the point of being blinding. He'll be doing clerical work. Everyone in the office, please assist him, especially you, Yolanda. Nice to meet you all. Yolanda is Mr. Truman's wife. She apparently works alongside him as a clerk. When I greeted everyone again, the other clerks responded warmly. The clerical staff seemed to be older on average compared to the people handling deliveries. They all appeared to be kind, older men and women. Mr. Truman and Yolanda were both all smiles as well. A little time passed after I joined, and I started to get the hang of the job, if only slightly. Mr. Truman was exactly the kind person he appeared to be, almost strangely so. He would even go around serving drinks to employees during work hours. Yolanda, on the other hand, was always busy, I often saw her sweeping the entrance or tending to the flower beds every day. It's nice to call it a family-like atmosphere, but honestly, I thought the pace here was a bit too relaxed. Oh no, I messed up. Given the age range, it might be expected, but the systems at this company are a bit outdated. Invoices, delivery slips, and internal forms are all handwritten. When I realized I had made a mistake on a delivery slip at the last minute, I couldn't help but let out a groan. Oh dear, did you make a mistake? Yes, I'll have to rewrite it. Hearing my sigh, Yolanda handed me a new slip, saying, I do that all the time too. Since the delivery address was quite long, rewriting it was going to be a bit of a hassle. If only we could use a computer and printer to print these things, this wouldn't be an issue. I silently rewrote the slip, all the while lamenting the situation in my head. This time, I finished it without any mistakes. It was just one slip for an urgent matter, so it wasn't too bad, but the person responsible for this task has to write several of these every day. They should probably switch to a more efficient method, especially for invoices. Some people do use computers but it's for tasks that are the complete opposite of efficiency. For example, there's someone who goes through the mysterious ritual of re-entering the destination items and tracking numbers into a spreadsheet after sending a package. If we had a scanner, we could just save everything as a PDF, but it seems there's no such high-tech equipment here. Oh, wait, here's a better way to do that. She was entering dates one by one into a spreadsheet, taking about a second for each key press. She wasn't very familiar with using a computer yet. I showed her how to use the autofill feature. A task that would have taken her several minutes was completed in just a few seconds. She blinked in astonishment. Wow, that's amazing. How did you do that? Well, first, you do this here. Even though it wasn't really a complex procedure, she was carefully jotting down every word I said. And then, it automatically fills in the rest like this. I didn't know there was such a trick. Hugo, you really know your way around a computer. Seeing her reaction, I couldn't help but be a little impressed, despite myself. I'm an old man, I'm an old woman. Many people stop learning for such reasons. But not her. You could see the determination in her eyes to eventually master this modern tool called a computer. As a newbie, it feels strange to say this, but this company is small. Yet, it seems to me that my senior colleagues are just stagnant. The story of me teaching someone about computers spread throughout the company in no time. I just teach them the basics, like simple functions and shortcut keys, but the employees are like amazing, and they praise me in an exaggerated way. 
I quickly gained a reputation as the go-to computer expert. As I started to see some positive results in improving work efficiency and began to feel more confident, there was someone who didn't take it well. Hey, Hugo, stop doing things on your own. One day, right as I arrived at work in the morning, I was suddenly reprimanded. As I looked around, confused, a man emerged from the back of the office. It was Rudy, the office manager here, who was also my direct supervisor. Good morning. I don't need your greetings. I didn't think I had done anything to deserve being scolded, but he was heading toward me with an intense expression. I hear you've been meddling with how we do things around here, even though you're just a newbie. Um, are you talking about the efficiency improvements? His complaints were vague and without specifics. Unfortunately, I'm all too familiar with such unreasonable behavior. I hate to admit it, but my experience at the toxic workplace is somewhat coming in handy. But the way things are now, it's too much work for everyone. Shut up. Just stop doing things on your own. As I was getting scolded, other clerks started arriving one by one. There was a bit of a commotion as they wondered what was going on, and Mr. Truman and Yolanda, who had heard Rudy's voice, also came over. What's the matter, Rudy? A senior employee asked him, but he wasn't calming down. This guy's been messing around without permission. Rudy kept shouting the same thing over and over. It's true that changing how work is done without consulting anyone isn't good. I probably should have at least discussed it with someone first, but does he really need to be this angry? Calm down, Rudy, Mr. Truman said. Mr. Truman, how can you stay calm about this? Despite Mr. Truman's gentle attempt to soothe him, Rudy's tantrum didn't subside. A few people around were visibly shrinking back. Rudy. E, yes. Seeing this, Mr. Truman called out his name sharply. Finally, Rudy fell silent. Listen carefully, Rudy. This company's operational system is outdated by industry standards. As the office manager, you should be well aware of that, right? Yes. Mr. Truman expressed his support for the work efficiency improvements I had been leading. He explained that he wanted everyone to work together to grow the company. Even just a little. After hearing this, Rudy quietly apologized, saying, I'm sorry. The morning uproar finally settled down. So, Hugo, I'm entrusting you with the task of improving our work efficiency. Feel free to proceed as you see fit. And everyone, if you need any help from me, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you very much. Mr. Truman said bye and went out for a meeting. However, throughout the day, I could feel Rudy's unpleasant gaze on me. It wasn't quite hatred. It was more like he was looking at me with some kind of jealousy. After that, I continued to use my spare time to build systems to improve work efficiency. Since I had received direct permission from Mr. Truman, I was able to expand my efforts even more than before. I started with the core of the company, the order processing system. I made it so that the food warehouse's inventory, what had come in and what was left, was visible, allowing the order processors to keep track in real time. Next, I tackled the smaller aspects of the office. Re-entering handwritten delivery slips into the computer for storage was too much work. I introduced scanners and changed the process to save documents as electronic files. For now, they're stored on memory drives. But I've also pitched to Mr. Truman the idea of setting up an internal server for storage in the future. Since that would involve a significant cost, I can't do it on my own. It's become so convenient. Yes, look, storing documents is now as simple as this. Everyone seemed particularly fond of the scanner, 
and they always looked happy when converting documents to PDF. By this time, most people had gotten used to working on computers, and some even expressed their gratitude, saying, thank you. It's made things so much easier, in a rather exaggerated manner. Yolanda was among them, and I began to be seen as a valued member of the team by Mr. and Mrs. Truman as well. With more efficiency in the office, there was even talk of expanding our market. Thinking that my work was helping the company grow made my job incredibly enjoyable. But I'm being glared at again. However, it seemed Rudy wasn't pleased with all of this. One day, while I was working in the office as usual, Rudy came over to my desk. Hugo, we've got a bit of a crisis in the field, there aren't enough delivery people. I need you to go help out. Understood. He said he had already gotten Mr. Truman's approval, so I borrowed the truck keys and quickly got in. Of course, it wasn't a new vehicle, and it was a manual transmission. They said the car was just inspected the other day, but is this okay? I'm a little scared. Back in school, my driver's education course had the rare option of teaching both manual and automatic, and out of curiosity, I took both. But I hadn't touched a clutch pedal since then. I drove the unfamiliar vehicle for about half an hour, heading toward the designated school. Uh, this should be the area. I had set up the navigation on my phone, but the roads were so convoluted that I couldn't find the exact location. The GPS announced, you have arrived at your destination, but I still couldn't pinpoint the entrance. The destination was likely just around the corner, and I could even see the building. This is frustrating. Maybe I should ask for directions. I parked the truck and decided to call the office on my phone. I dialed the number registered under the office. This is Rudy came the voice after two rings. Since my phone was registered with the office, he immediately knew it was me calling. It's Hugo. I'm near the destination, but I can't seem to find the entrance. What? Don't bother me with something like that. I was scolded so harshly that I instinctively pulled the phone away from my ear for a moment. I'm really sorry, but I'm completely lost. We're busy here too. Just figure it out on your own. But, oh. I tried to argue, but he abruptly hung up on me. The office staff probably wouldn't know the detailed directions, and as for the other drivers. This is terrible, I don't know their phone numbers. I'd always called them from the office phone using speed dial, so I never memorized them. Guess I'll just have to keep searching. I stared at the map app for nearly 20 minutes, before finally finding what seemed to be the right road. It was a narrow path, barely wide enough for the truck. No wonder I couldn't find it on my first try. I deeply apologize for the delay. I finally managed to reach the school and deliver the food supplies. However, I was significantly behind schedule. We can't afford to have such delays. We need to cook on time. I'm truly sorry. I was thoroughly scolded by the kitchen staff. I repeated my apologies over and over. Whether or not they forgave me, I returned to the office feeling utterly downcast. As soon as I walked in, I saw Rudy standing there with a furious expression. We got a complaint from the school because of you. What are you going to do about it? Apparently, the kitchen staff had called the company multiple times due to the delay. The office staff had been quite worried due to the frequent calls. I'm sorry, but if you had given me directions when I called, don't talk back to me. They said they're not going to order from us anymore. The next order will be their last. You've caused us to lose an important client. Can you take responsibility for that? It was clear he wasn't interested in hearing my side of the story. 
Don't talk back is an unbeatable phrase. Once it's said, you're completely stuck. Come on, Rudy, there's no need to yell like that. A senior office clerk stepped in to try and help me out. But it seemed that this time, Rudy's anger wouldn't be so easily soothed. Shut up. This doesn't concern you, so stay out of it. The senior clerk recoiled at his harsh tone. It's not that I'm entirely blameless for the late delivery. I should have double-checked the directions and landmarks before setting out. However, I also feel that Rudy's response was far from appropriate. Um, did the kids at the school get their lunch on time? I felt genuinely sorry if this situation caused any delay in their meals or if they missed out on eating altogether. That doesn't matter. What are you babbling about? Though I was concerned about the children, ultimately our customers, Rudy only grew angrier. Slamming his fist on the desk as he yelled. Did I really ask something so wrong? You better watch yourself. I'm sorry. He glared at me as I shrank back, then returned to his desk. According to the whiteboard, Mr. Truman was out of the office. I decided I would apologize to him when he returned. With that plan in mind, I resumed my work, but Rudy kept muttering under his breath. The atmosphere in the office was tense and miserable for the rest of the day. As the clock ticked past the end of the workday, one by one, my colleagues left after saying their goodbyes. Apparently, Mr. Truman was going to head straight home. I thought about leaving and apologizing first thing in the morning. Just as I was about to pack up and leave, Rudy approached me again. Hey, Hugo. Yes? This time, his demeanor was completely different from earlier. He spoke in a gentle tone, with a soft expression on his face. You're fired. It doesn't matter if you're here or not. As soon as Rudy finished speaking, his face twisted into a malicious grin. A smug look of triumph. I was so taken aback that my mind went blank. After a few seconds, I realized what was happening and thought to myself, you don't have the authority to fire me, do you? But it would only escalate things or trigger another tantrum. I decided not to say it. Understood. I averted my gaze by looking down at the floor. As I turned to leave, Rudy, looking pleased with himself, said, I'll inform Mr. Truman, so you don't need to come in tomorrow. He then made a shooing gesture with his hand. Thank you for everything. I said in a low voice, bidding farewell to the company. That night, I received a call from Mr. Truman, who must have learned about the situation. Don't worry about it. You just go ahead and do what you need to do. His voice was gentle, genuinely kind. So much so that it nearly brought me to tears, especially in contrast to Rudy. Thank you so much, Mr. Truman. Even though he couldn't see me over the phone, I was on the verge of tears as I thanked him. No need to thank me, Hugo. I'm the one who should be thanking you. Well, good night. Yes, good night. I placed a hand on my chest as I ended the call. Even though I still felt down if I was fired, so be it. I'd proceed with my plans with Mr. Truman. Six months after I was fired from the company, I visited a brand new building, just as I had been doing regularly. This is my new workplace. Wait, is that... Standing in front of the entrance was a familiar figure. He looked quite disheveled, as if he had rushed over here in a panic. It was a man in a wrinkled suit. Rudy? What are you doing here? Hugo. It's all because of you. The moment he saw me, Rudy lunged at me. Whoa, watch out. I dodged to the side, causing him to stumble and fall. As he got up, wincing and muttering ouch, ouch, he glared at me with a look of pure anger. 
Because of you, the company went out of business. How dare you? As Rudy said, after I left, Mr. Truman's company indeed closed down. Most of the employees from there transferred to this company, which I had founded. So, it wasn't like I needed him to tell me in such an angry manner, I was already well aware. No, it wasn't my fault. Mr. Truman was considering retirement due to his age. At that time, I patented the company's system. And he allowed me to start a new company with a fresh start. I calmly explained this to Rudy, whose face twisted with confusion. Patent? Isn't that company property? Mr. Truman was kind enough to let me file the patent personally, as I was the one who developed it. I continued to state the facts to the fuming Rudy. The contrast seemed to irritate him even more, and he retorted, nearly in tears. Right after you left, the company's system stopped working. What did you do? I couldn't help but be astonished. Was this man really the office manager? Of course it did. There was no authorization to use it. But we've always used it. Why would we need authorization now? No matter what I said, Rudy had a rebuttal for everything. That's not how it works. Every other company has applied for usage, and there's no special treatment. When I said it a little harder, he just groaned, ah. Well, maybe none of this would have happened if someone hadn't fired me. I added with a sharp edge, unable to keep my emotions in check. The company quickly fell apart after it reverted to the old, outdated systems. They had taken on too much work, more than could be managed manually. Meanwhile, the company I started was growing rapidly. The patent for the operational system allowed me to earn licensing fees. And with Mr. Truman's support, the company flourished. When I first discussed the patent application with Mr. Truman, he turned the conversation around to me. What? You want to start a new company using this patent as a cornerstone? Yes. I've been thinking of closing up the business. He explained that he wanted me to take over the clients and employees. But then he shared another shocking reason. Closing up isn't just because of my age, there's another reason. A reason? Mr. Truman looked down with a somber expression before returning to his usual cheerful demeanor as he explained. Yolanda has terminal colon cancer. What? I was speechless. I never would have guessed. She always seemed so healthy, yet she was battling such a terrible illness. The doctor said she doesn't have much time left. She doesn't even know yet. Yolanda. Given the circumstances, Mr. Truman wanted to retire and spend their remaining time together peacefully. I'm sorry to burden you with all this, but I trust you can handle it. Also, please keep this matter between us. He suggested that we tell the employees that the closure was due to poor performance. So Yolanda wouldn't become suspicious. I truly apologize for involving everyone in this. He added, leaving me at a loss for words. I felt a deep sense of responsibility to do whatever I could for Mr. Truman and Yolanda. That sense of duty weighed on me heavily. It was shortly after that when the incident with the delayed delivery occurred. Conveniently fired after that, I took the opportunity to fully launch the new company. Thanks to Mr. Truman's groundwork with our clients and employees, the company grew rapidly within just six months. Since I had promised to keep the matter a secret, I didn't mention anything about Yolanda's illness to Rudy. However, it's your fault that Mr. Truman's wife got sick, he muttered. Somehow, Rudy knew about Yolanda's illness, and he said it as if blaming me. Did Mr. Truman tell you that? I asked. He shook his head. I was jealous of you. You came in as a newcomer, made a big impact, 
and got all that attention from Mr. Truman and his wife. Through tears, he admitted that he had tried to bring me down out of jealousy. When he heard that the person he had ousted went on to start a new company and made $10 million in profits, he was stunned. On top of that, as employees began to transfer one by one to my new company, he became convinced that I was the villain. Rudy's voice trembled as he recounted this. I had somewhat sensed his feelings, but hearing it directly was still a shock. How is Mrs. Truman doing? She can't even get out of bed anymore. What? His response was far worse than I had imagined, and I couldn't help but raise my voice in shock. Internally, I cursed the fact that Mr. Truman hadn't told me sooner. Was it because he didn't want me to worry? Rudy, do you know which hospital Yolanda is in? Ha! Huh? Do you know where she is? When he didn't respond, I pressed him, and he finally snapped out of it. E, yes, I know. I'll drive. This time, make sure to give me proper directions. I practically forced the now-defeated Rudy into the passenger seat of the company car, and he guided me to the hospital. When we arrived, I rushed to Yolanda's room. There she was, lying in bed, with Mr. Truman sitting on a foldable chair beside her. Oh, you came? She greeted me with a raspy voice. The woman who used to cheerfully sweep the entrance was now a shadow of her former self. Her limbs had grown frail, and it seemed like the wrinkles on her face had deepened significantly. She looked like a different person. Thank you for coming to see me, Huey. Aunt Yolanda. We addressed each other with the nicknames we hadn't used in years. Yolanda had known me since childhood. She was the neighbor who looked after me instead of daycare and played games with me. That is this Yolanda. Though we weren't related by blood, our families had always been close. Yolanda was the one who took me in when I was holed up after quitting the toxic workplace. Sorry, I couldn't visit more often. It's okay. You've been busy with the new company, right? I gently held her hand. Her fingers, now so thin, felt like they were just skin and bones. Make sure to visit your parents sometimes, okay? The last time we talked, your mom was complaining a bit. She said with a familiar, gentle smile that hadn't changed over the years. As Rudy watched Yolanda and me chatting warmly, he seemed surprised. Mr. Truman patted Rudy's back gently and said, Thank you for coming, Rudy. Yolanda is a lucky woman to have you here. He say thank you for that. His words of gratitude moved all three of us to tears. The only one who wasn't crying was Yolanda, who just kept smiling. That evening, with a peaceful expression on her face, Yolanda passed away. Sometime later, Rudy made an appointment and visited my company. He was dressed impeccably, and I led him to the conference room, wondering what was going on. I was jealous of you before, and I unfairly blamed you, even driving you to resign. It was all because of my own shortcomings. I can't apologize enough. He said quickly, as he attempted to kneel before me. Whoa, no need for that. I quickly stopped him, holding his shoulder and urging him to stand. He explained that Mr. Truman had told him everything. The real reason the company was closed and why I was close to Mr. and Mrs. Truman. Realizing he had wronged me without knowing the full story, Rudy was filled with regret. Although Rudy kept insisting it was all his fault. I knew I had things to apologize for as well. I'm sorry, too, for acting so immaturely. Rudy had a strong sense of loyalty to Mr. Truman. It must have bothered him to see someone like me, who had joined through a mid-career hire, getting close to Mr. Truman so quickly. I had suspected this from the beginning but did nothing about it. We should have talked things out back then. Yeah. Rudy mentioned that he had switched to a completely different industry. 
We might never cross paths again, given our respective fields. With that in mind, I extended my right hand. Rudy didn't say anything but smiled and shook my hand firmly. After that, my company continued to grow. Our achievements were recognized, and we were able to resume our business with the school where the delayed delivery had happened. We're here with your food supplies, I said. I personally handled the first delivery, wanting to offer my apologies as well. Navigating the same tricky roads, I arrived at the school where the stern-faced kitchen staff member greeted me. On time this time, huh? I'm sorry for the previous time. No need to apologize. Your president already came by and apologized personally. Apparently, Mr. Truman had gone to the school himself to apologize after the incident. So, I heard his wife passed away? Yes, from colon cancer. Such a shame. Why is it that the good ones always seem to go too soon? His words, spoken with genuine sadness, brought tears to my eyes. Well, I need to get back to cooking. Looking forward to working with you again, Mr. Connor. Yes, thank you, and I look forward to working with you too. I nodded in acknowledgement and climbed into the now familiar truck. Yolanda never had children of her own. Maybe that's why she was so kind to the neighborhood kids. She probably took great pride in her work, handling the ingredients for school lunches. As I started the engine and looked up at the blue sky through the window, I thought, I'll visit her grave after work. There's still so much gratitude I haven't had the chance to express to Yolanda. As these thoughts crossed my mind, I could almost hear her gentle voice, as if she were still there with me.